cannot be understated how important good sound design is for creating fear. Some of the most iconic moments in horror media are made possible by their soundtracks. And games? Games are no exception to this. Many of the most disturbing songs are found in video games, though I think it's all the more impressive when they're found outside of the horror genre. For one, since these are non-horror games, the disturbing bits can really catch you off guard. For two, the entries from stuff for younger audiences have to be a lot more clever with their scares since they can't rely on the usual tricks. The rules for this list are fairly straightforward. First off, no bops. If I can vibe to it, it's gonna lose points. Secondly, these cannot actively hurt to listen to. That's cheating, so no Lavender Town. The main way I'm gonna be ranking these entries is by relativity. The less disturbing the game and the more disturbing the song, the better. One last thing to note is I've done this list before, way back in 2011, and I'm not gonna repeat a single song from that list here. So if there's a song you feel is missing, check the old list, you might find it there. In Virtue's Last Reward, you're forced to participate in the A-B game, a death game where every decision could be your last. Right off the bat, we already have a tense atmosphere and high stakes. It also doesn't help that there's a virus that makes people kill themselves going around. Not sure I'm allowed to make that reference. The music of Virtue's Last Reward is absolutely stellar, with fitting music for both the mind-bending puzzles as well as the more emotional moments. There were a couple of songs to choose from, but Sublimity was the easy choice. What just happened? This song perfectly captures the nature of the Nonary games. Fear, isolation, dread. Your closest allies could be the ones that stab you in the back. On top of all of this, you have to face horrific realizations about yourself and others. What really makes Sublimity great is the escalating sense of horror. Like the game itself, it piles on more and more disturbing elements. The horrific whale in particular really sells it. Unfortunately, I have to take off a lot of points due to how the song is used. Rather than play during horrific reveals, it tends to play during the more introspective moments. It's especially egregious with how effective this one was. Seriously, there were so many better opportunities to use the song. Why not use it during Clover's ending, for instance? Entry. Undertale has no shame in hiding how ridiculous it can get, whether it's on the weird and fun side or the dark and shocking aspects. One of the biggest catalysts to all that? This guy. Flowey is a character who takes the guise of a friendly little posy when really he's a megalomaniac who only wants to draw you to a dark path. How dark is it? Well, let's have a look at his final battle. Kicking things off, everything is already pretty bizarre and unsettling. Flowey breaks your save file and taunts you while a distorted note hangs over the scene. And when the villain takes center stage, you hear a slow, creeping siren as Flowey slowly edges into the screen. And after that, chaos. <laughs> As Flowey bombards you with his arsenal of mind funkery, the music grows just as cluttered with heavy percussions blasting through the song. It serves its purpose well as a backdrop to the sheer insanity you gotta deal with. Just to make it even more jarring, the intermissions of the fight played much softer and more optimistic variations of Flowey's scene. Last a few seconds before you get thrown right back into the chaotic mess again. It's no 
stretch to say that this is not a very comforting song to listen to. It's intentionally disorienting to a comical degree, and we love it just for how ridiculous it is. However, I do have to deduct a few points since towards the climax of the song, it loses out on that disturbing edge. The song turns into an energetic remix of Flowey's theme, and from that point on, the song becomes a bop. Yes, it's a necessary tone shift to keep the tension of the fight going, but man, imagine having that terrifying first part be all you can hear in this seemingly hopeless battle. Never thought a lack of subtlety could be so inspiring. Yoshi's Topsy Turby is one of those games that kind of just exists. The game isn't terrible or anything, it just has a clunky tilting gimmick that can be a bit of a turnoff lest you emulate the game. Even standing next to some of the bubblier Yoshi games, this one doesn't really become a big talking topic for most people. But hey, that just means there are more untouched territories to talk about. In Topsy Turvy, Yoshi's trapped inside a pop-up book alongside his island. There, he finds some peculiar spirits who test him through each world before he can advance to the next page of the book. One of them wants you to beat up a lot of enemies. One of them wants you to finish the level as fast as possible. And one is... Cha-ching, 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 Gary! Money, oh money, how I love thee! Once you reach World 6, you're met with the Spirit of Fright. Unlike the other spirits in the game, this one doesn't ask much from you. He simply wants to play a little game. A game where he chases you across every level with a giant page-tearing steamroller. As he appears, you hear his theme, an ominous mix of slow tuba and soft piano keys, an homage to the Jaws theme. Granted, it's bit crushed, but for what it is, it gets the job done. You hear this frightening theme every time you play through a level plagued by the spirit's morbid little toy. And yes, it's quite the spike in tone compared to how cheery and sickly sweet the rest of the game is. These levels are also some of the hardest in the game, so the impact and tension surrounding the song are certainly put to good use. Not much else to say about this one. It's not terribly jarring or creepy, but it's a decent, scary little song that sticks out in a particularly bright game. Now, something tells me that given this game's underground reputation, this song would make for some prime creepypasta material. I mean, if people can dump lore about a single pedestal in Mario 64, I don't think much is off limits anymore. Even after you've completed Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony, the fun doesn't end there. Afterwards, you unlock the ultimate talent development plan, a fun little bonus board game level. The rules are simple. Play as any of the characters from the mainline games, roll the dice, and reach a certain goal before the end of a year. It's fun, it's simple, it's lighthearted, and nobody has to die. And nothing can possibly... you're doing in my bonus mode yeah this is what happens if you don't reach your goal by the end of the year or if you land in the despair spaces you're shipped off to the despair course an eerie prison-like board littered with despair squares that affect your stats but the most unsettling part of this course the music throughout the board this eerie intimidating track plays on loop and I'm not gonna lie, it gives me an alien vibe of sorts. The way it echoes and toys with your anxiety, lurking, slinking, making you look around and feel like at any moment... Honey, can we burn the house down? What? Thankfully, there are no aliens to jump you, but again, doesn't it feel like something out of that? It sounds way too eerie and I love it. Admittedly, it's not as long as I feel like it could be, but with how much tension it builds, I prefer to call it short but sweet. It takes what little time it's given and makes it count in the spookiest way, even if it is just for a board game. To this day, I still cannot believe I didn't include a Metroid song on the original list. Time to fix that.
Metroid Fusion. What a great game that does a fantastic job in edging Metroid all the closer to the horror genre. All thanks to its daunting atmosphere, gratuitous story, and the SAX. So you just got through your first encounter with Samus's creepy replica. Nicely done. I say you're set to continue your mission. Just take the elevator. This isn't your average everyday darkness. This is advanced darkness. So, the power went out, and you have to take another path back around to your ship. All the while, you hear Silence 2, a short yet haunting tune that plays as you traverse these dim elevator shafts. It may just be three repeated notes on a piano, but dang if it didn't send goosebumps. What makes the song even more creepy is that at that point, you just got done running away from one of the scariest enemies in the game. Just when you thought you're safe, the game throws another curveball immediately after, and it's such an effective way to throw you off your guard and instill dread. The song would have been higher on the list if this part of the game lasted a bit longer. The theme itself may be simple, but it gets a lot of points for audacity alone. Anything that puts fusion in the spotlight of fear is welcome by me. After a 10 year gap, not counting season 1 remastered or the Poker Night games, Sam and Max Freelance Police finally made a comeback, and they decided to try something new outside of their traditional point and click adventure gameplay, a VR game, appropriately titled This Time, It's Virtual. In this latest installment, you compete in a series of obstacles and challenges for your audition to join the Freelance Police, so with them taking a big step outside their comfort zone, how'd they do? Somewhere between brain dead and unformed pile of clay just how we like them. Not too bad, honestly. The puzzles are pretty standard as far as VR games go, though the Steam release apparently has a lot of bugs to sort out and the controls aren't always functional. But the writing, voice acting, and music are what really shine through in the end. Speaking of, the music is mostly recycled tracks from previous Sam & Max games mixed with brand new tracks by Telltale Games composer Jared Emerson Johnson, including one particularly twisted shanty. the Aqua Bears, the eerie little earworm based on the abandoned theme park Captain Aqua Bears Fun Time Park. Honestly, I didn't know what to expect when I first heard this song, but it's actually pretty good. It's the fun kind of disturbing. You know when something purposely and hilariously comes off as creepy or problematic while trying to pass itself off as charming and whimsical? That's pretty much this song's tone in a nutshell. The music has a very kitty, upbeat vibe while the lyrics are kind of menacing in a sense. These high-pitched munchkin voices singing about how the Aqua Bears, this game's version of Water Bear slash Sea Monkeys, are basically immune to everything. Heat, cold, nothing can kill them. And they're so microscopic they can be anywhere in your hair, in your underwear, and to infinity and beyond. Yes, because that's what all of the kitties want to hear when they go to an amusement park, right? Well, not sure what to expect when your mascots look like this. It's creepy, it's annoyingly catchy, it's just plain fun and fits perfectly with the zany, absurd tone of the freelance police. And as an added bonus, it doubles as your secret weapon for taking out the Aqua Bears near the end. So some good came out of listening to it on repeat. As long as you're not a germaphobe plagued with the knowledge that these little bees are floating around your breathing space and literally nothing can kill them. Isn't science fun? You'd think a game called Skullgirls would be in the horror genre. Surprise! It's a fighting game with themes from early 1900s film noir and other media. Sure, there are dark elements like parasites, zombies, a 13-year-old maid becoming a literal demigod, and the most disturbing, a little girl wielding a demonic umbrella. Oof. Well, despite these pretty macabre elements, the majority of the game isn't taken as seriously as you'd think. It can be emotional, but nothing seriously gruesome or overly disturbing. Okay, that isn't true. Anything regarding Double or Eliza or even Valentine to a degree can be pretty out there. But the one thing that really disturbs players is the introduction of a new stage when Eliza was added. 
the Hellscape Gehenna. No one knows what Gehenna is. It's a pit of evil where no being who enters could ever leave. The setting is different from anywhere else in the game, with an emphasis on actual grotesque imagery rather than the normal gothic and spooky atmosphere we're used to. And the music that plays, Chamber Below, fits this place to a T. <laughs> appears twice in the story mode of First Encore, and both times you're fighting this game's Lovecraftian nightmare double, a shape-shifting monstrosity that makes all the game's numerous parasitic creatures seem tame. And I'm pretty sure this is her stomach. This is just getting worse and worse. Chamber Below takes everything this game throws at you and digests it. It makes you listen to the cries of the game as it's digesting. It's pretty freaky. Combine that with the stage and technically character attached to this song too, and you got one song that won't be leaving your mind or your nightmares anytime soon. Can we go back to the days where the scariest thing for me in Skullgirls was Valentine's Finisher? Please? When I was thinking about disturbing songs in non-horror games, Zelda was one of the first series to cross my mind. And of course, the first game to cross my mind was Majora's Mask. But we kind of already did Ikana Canyon from Majora in my original list, so I want to look at another creepy game in the Zelda catalog. Hey, Twilight Princess has some trippy and crap your pants moments, let's go there. Throughout Twilight Princess, you meet this adorable little bird creature named Uko, Uku, I don't know, who acts as your teleport out of dungeon mechanic along with her son, Uku Jr. They are members of the Uka tribe, I guess they aren't that creative with their names, and they are from the mysterious city in the sky, the remains of a civilization in the heavens above Hyrule. Now, while I could wax poetic about the meaning of the city and its supposed connections to Skyward Sword or Breath of the Wild 2, let's get to the meat of it. The song that plays here, it's a bit unnerving. <laughs> Yeah, the song starts a little jarring with a mild melody and some singing ukas to a distorted melody that is accompanied by what sounds like the last whimpers of the ukas. It fits with Twilight's theme of two sides of one coin, the world of light and the world of twilight. The two halves represent the ukas before and after the twilight invasion. Does it not that the entire city is abandoned other than the forces of twilight and the remaining uka are sheltered in a shop in short numbers? While there are more in-your-face alarming moments in Twilight Princess and dungeons that have a more macabre feel to them, City in the Sky shows a more backgroundy, morbid, and disturbing theme. The remains of a once prosperous civilization and the screaming cries of its former citizens ringing in your ear as you travel through it. Only thing is, instead of screams, you hear muffled cries. Honestly, that might be more unsettling. Good old-fashioned surrealism, a creative moment that allows one to bend reality in any form of media in the name of art. While not really intended to scare anyone, some surrealist pieces are more 
unsettling than others, which leads us to today's little art project, Off by Unproductive Fun Time. Well, something's definitely off. Besides that pun, dang it! Joking aside, this little French beauty plays like a classic RPG, following our protagonist, the batter, on his journey to purify five different zones, which essentially translates to beating the crap out of ghosts and boss battles. Already, players love the game's story, characters, gameplay, and bizarre imagery, but what really won critics over was how atmospheric the game was, and of course, a lot of that is thanks to the music. honest, it was really hard to pick one song or track because they all hit a different kind of spooky chord in one way or another. The lighter toned tracks carry a haunting element in every beat, the fast paced ones have some form of distortion that's almost guaranteed to give you the creepers jeepers. tracks that start off friendly enough with some really nice water ambience and then slowly fade into an eerie tempo. And some tracks feature a really, really creepy whispering that practically crawls on your skin. sleeping with the lights on tonight. And then there's the Game Over screen song, sung by the game's composer, Elias Conrad Coldwood. It only features four lyrics. Bat. See that? It's like they're practically begging you to stay down. You're not ready for whatever bizarre, unearthly forces are ahead if you try and play again, and they're gonna make sure this face is embedded into your brain in the creepiest way possible. It was too hard to pick one single track, so I choose all of them. All of them? All of them. The whole dang soundtrack, could why not? Every track stands out in its own eerie way that just defines the surreal genre. Not exactly horror, but it's pretty close and definitely effective. Just hope you don't find yourself so spooked that you're put off from playing the- Ugh. Come on, guys! I pay them too much for this. Action 52! Are you serious? Yeah, the next one's from Action 52. I'm serious. For those not in the know, Action 52 is widely considered to be one of the worst games of all time. As the name implies, it's a collection of 52 different games. They all suck, each in their own special ways. Then again, the whole thing was put together in three months, so I can't say I blame the devs, but I do, this thing was a ripoff. The closest thing to a positive in Action 52 is the music. Specifically, the Lollipops Level 3 theme is a rare example of disturbing NES music. Why is this disturbing? It's just two notes alternating at undulating tempos. Was this intentional? If so, Action 52 actually did something right. If not, talk about a happy little accident. I mean, I know it's short, but what else is there to say? Of course, it would probably be a lot more disturbing if we weren't playing as a buff guy wielding a giant lollipop. The original Persona was a very different beast from what we know now. 
between the grid-based combat, optional characters, and a massive amount of elemental attributes, the series has changed drastically over the years. Things start out normal enough with you and your friends trying out a game you heard about, only for a ghost girl to appear and lightning to strike the surroundings. You then have a vision of a strange man who tells you about the power of personas. Then you wake up in the infirmary as if nothing went wrong. Your teacher very justifiably tells you to go to the hospital, paying a visit to your friend there along the way. Things seem fine at first until she collapses. Then zombies invade. In the ensuing battle, you awaken to your personas. But rather than some heroic music to make you feel determined in the dungeon afterwards, you hear this. Nope, we're going with the PS1 version. Just listen and you'll see how big the downgrade was. There we go. This is the song that pretty much says, Welcome to Hell. There wasn't any buildup or normalcy for this. You just fell in the deep end. Between the demented piano and the wailing, you know that something has just gone horribly wrong. The songs in the background just make you picture the zombies ripping the helpless hospital patients apart. How is this game rated kids to adults in its original release again? When you hear the words doom and music together, what genre comes to mind? There you are. The one thing preventing the forces of hell from escaping further. It's your job to send these a-holes back to where they belong. By the time you're done with them, there's a new paint job's worth of blood and gore to clean up. Yeah! But when you step back and really think about it, being the doom guy would suck. In spite of his awesomeness, he's still a regular human being with no supernatural powers. He's had to go through this hell multiple times. And if you ever wanted to hear music that reflected this, look no further than the accurately named Breakdown. Dread. Pure, unfiltered dread. This is the horrific reality that the Doom guy is facing. You're outnumbered by hundreds to one. At any point, one of them could jump out and non-figuratively tear you apart. This song is less music and more an increasingly disturbing series of sounds. Of course, Doom 64 placed more emphasis on horror than the previous game, so it does lose some points for that. Still though, pretty impressive considering the sounds of the demons were made by moaning into a Taco Bell cup. Gathered friends, listen again to our legend of the Bionicle. In the time before time, LEGO created one of its most iconic toy lines to date. The product itself rich in creativity, and the lore ever so expanding. I'm not kidding, they went big when developing the lore for the Bionicle franchise. Novels, comic books, feature films, and yes, even video games. Arguably the best one was the Bionicle Mata Nui online game. A free-to-play flash game where you travel across the entire land of Mata Nui, meeting the locals and learning a bit more about the island's history, and helping your fellow Matoran along the way. It's a fun game for sure, and really helps give us a taste of the franchise's narrative. But how is the music? I mean, it's still a flash game, and you don't expect them to really put too much effort into music for a flash game. <laughs> Holy sh**! That? That is some of the most atmospheric music I've ever heard in a game. I'm serious, I can actually use some of these tracks for D&D ambiance. They've got epic battle music. Forboarding atmosphere scores. Charming native tracks.
and even a fun recreation of Flight of the Valkyries. And each one hits on a different level, but which one really hits that creepy vibe to earn the soundtrack a place on this list? That'll do it. When you approach the great telescope on the beach, you start hearing some eerie, intimidating sounds. It sends a chill through your bones that fills you with a feeling of uncertainty, like things are happening beyond your comprehension and you're not sure who you are, what your destiny is, what will happen to the island, and what that red star through the telescope is supposed to mean. Is it a symbol of things to come? Or is it something greater? Or is it just a clever gimmick for fans to find out the release date of each chapter of the game? Yes! Whatever you want to call it, the telescope ambiance music is a delightfully ominous track that is guaranteed to give you goosebumps. And it's just one of the amazing atmospheric tracks this game has to offer. Honestly, they didn't have to put so much effort into the music. Although, they didn't have to put so much effort into the actual franchise either. But they did, and I respect the heck out of them for it. And it makes me sad that they did the reboot and wiped clean all that hard work and passion. The East series is a niche but long-running action RPG series that's been gaining more traction in the West with the releases of its games on PC and Switch. Emphasis on long-running as it's even older than Final Fantasy and still going. Due to its age, it was one of the first RPG series to have a full booming soundtrack as the developer behind it, Ian Falcom, wanted to put emphasis on the soundtrack in addition to the gameplay and story. So the composers behind the game, Miyako Ishikawa, Hideya Nagata, and the main composer, Yuzo Koshiro, now more known for Streets of Rage and Etrian Odyssey, made a classic soundtrack that is still a bop to this day for Ease 1 and 2. Well, if there is a bop and a sidetrack, it wouldn't make this list. Luckily for the final level in Ease 2 though, Koshiro made a tune that was a bit more creepy. I have a small chill, but I feel like this song isn't as creepy as you'd think. Well, Falcom had a tendency to arrange their music tracks for every port of Ease 1 and 2, and they had like seven or eight ports. But here's the one I really had a chill to. There we go, the 2008 arrangement to the song done by composer Yukihiro Jindo for the PSP port of Ease 2 is the pinnacle of disturbing for Ease. Jindo took Koshiro's track and turned it up to 11 with additional instruments, echoey vibes, and a bit of robotic overturns to represent the robotic nature of Ease 2's final area. Other versions I recommend would be the versions from the PC Engine CD port and the DS port. Gosh, these games had a lot of ports. Pressure Road is a massive tone shift from the rest of Ease 2. While we did hear the song in the beginning of the game, hearing it again right before the final boss is creepy and jarring. Just listen to the song right before it and the song right after to understand how weird this tone shift is. Now that we're men, Spongebob the movie. It has a good ratio and it's definitely kinda spooky for a Spongebob game, but a bit too much of a bop. Stupefaction slash ridicule, Umineko. It's slightly unsettling, and for whatever reason I'm getting Metroid vibes. Hessonite's theme, Steven Universe, Save the Light. Pretty decent, got a nice sound to it, setting her up as the big bad, but again, too much of a bop.
What is it with JRPGs and licensed games having disturbing songs as non-horror? Seriously, this is the third JRPG game in like five entries. This one is also a Final Dungeon 2 like East 2. Weird. Anyways, Tales of Legendia, a more underrated entry in the Tales of series and one of the last games to use the 2D battle system that was present in older games. While the battle system didn't age as well as other Tales games, people praise the story and the music to no end. The music specifically hits every mood well with a varied soundtrack. Unfortunately, this also includes the mood of horrifically disturbing. Before we continue, listen to a piece from this song, Legendary Sorcerer. Nice, beautiful song, right? And now let's listen to the actual song for our list, Cradle of Time. Just to be clear, I didn't do a thing to this song. This is what actually plays in the final dungeon of Legendia. For some reason, composer Goshina took a beautiful song like Legendary Sorcerer, kidnapped it, beat it up in an abandoned warehouse with a bag over its head, left it there to rot for a week, and then placed it in a tire fire only to revive it as a zombie and then get shot dead a billion times by the cast of The Walking Dead. We should probably be glad that Sheena's style evolved to the point it is in God Eater and later Tales games because if he did something like this again, I don't know if the gaming community as a whole could handle it. I'm Josh Scorcher, and I'm going to be playing some less disturbing things uh, <laughs> to kind of get my mind off of what's going on. Um, I don't know, I hear Silent Hill 2 is nice this time of year. God. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.